Okay, hello and welcome to episode 77 of Question and Answer. I am your host, Panyo Basa. And we're getting into really high numbers. I never really anticipated getting up into the 70s on these things. And probably because the numbers are getting so high, I'm going to start getting the numbers wrong. Like skipping numbers or, I don't know, maybe even writing the numbers upside down or something. Just because the numbers are getting so high. I don't know how Joe Rogan does it. Anyways, I got back from vacation yesterday, drove from Lake Erie all the way to southern North Carolina in continuous snow. So global warming causes more snow is apparently the situation. And uh, yeah, we were like averaging like 45 miles an hour the whole way back just because of all the snow on the road and the snow falling onto the windshield and everything. So, but we did it. And here we are. I'm back in the studio room with the dogs. And so I'm going to start answering questions because that's like kind of why I do these. These question and answers is to uh, answer questions. And the first question is from Pranav. And Pranav says, what's the story of the founder of your ordination lineage who considered himself a bodhisattva? Yeah, that would be uh, Tong Pulu Siato, the very venerable late Tong Pulu Siato of central Burma, who was the founder of the Tong Pulu forest tradition in which I was ordained for 30 years. And um, it was common knowledge among the Burmese monks in the Tong Pulu tradition that he was a bodhisattva, that he wanted to become a Buddha in the future rather than just an ordinary arahant. And I think one of the main pieces of evidence for that was that when he was in America, he came to America two, two times, I think. Um, and some starry eyed Westerner asked him if he was an Arahant. And his reply was along the lines of, I have made a multi-life commitment, which indicated that he was a Bodhisattva or considered himself a Bodhisattva. And there are quite a lot of those, some of them with, um, better reasons than others, I think. But, um, like, I've been told that uh, Sita Gusiato, who is one of the most famous monks in Burma, also considers himself to be a bodhisattva. Um, what is the story of him? Well, I mean, he was just a simple village boy. He came from uh, central Burma, maybe 100 miles south of Mandalay like the general area of Maitila, if any of you know where Maitila is. And uh, he was less of a scholar than a lot of monks, but he was very strict in his practice, or at least his interpretation of, of Vunia he followed strictly. There were a few things that uh, he, he probably, I mean, I didn't consider it to be correct. For example, I think he considered dawn to be like 4 a.m., just around around the clock or just or just all year long he considered 4 a.m to be dawn which isn't exactly the case but something like that is relatively minor and he was one of the few forest monks who were really well i mean he, he made a name for himself just by being like an ascetic for example, he was so strict that he was even experimenting with trying to sleep in a standing position. Maybe he should have read the, the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, because uh, there were a few guys in there that learned how to sleep standing up in order to uh, survive the interrogation process. But um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what to say about him. I really, I never met him. He died before I had ever heard of him. But um, I was the the student or disciple of two of of his personal disciples and i'd been to his monastery i, I stayed at, at chalcin doya for more than three years which was his original monastery before he moved to tongpulu monastery tongpulu itself literally means something like teeny weeny hill tong means hill or mountain pulu is like itsy bitsy you know it's, it's a small hill and uh the, the monastery was located on top of the hill. And I think one reason why he became so famous was because Weibu Seattle was considered to be an arahant in central Burma. And when Weibu Seattle died, it was like the people were looking around 
for a kind of a, a successor for being like the famous enlightened Seattle and they settled on Tom Pulu Seattle. And he had one of the same teachers as Mahasi Seattle, which is explains why the Tom Pulu method and the Mahasi method are similar with regard to emphasizing mindfulness. Um, I can't remember the name of the famous monk who was instrumental in reviving mindfulness as a Theravada Buddhist meditation technique pretty much throughout the world. It was like the Mahasi method especially just spread to other Theravada Buddhist countries with a considerable resistance in Sri Lanka. There was uh, quite a lot of debate. You, I think you can find like the, the controversy going back and forth um, in some booklet that's uh, sold by the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka where it was like the the conservative Sri Lankan monks were sort of um, sort of arguing against the Mahasi method. But uh, let's see, what else can I say? He died back around 1980, plus or minus two years. So I was in high school at the time. Um, and he did come to America a few times and that's why there was a Tongpulu monastery established in America because he wanted Ameri he wanted to spread Dhamma to the West, which is a, an, a laudable motivation for coming to America. And uh, it didn't really work out very well, though, because there were, I mean, there's all kinds of problems. It was monasteries like ashrams can be a shit accelerators where it just kind of brings out people's neurotic tendencies and so forth. Just sort of the, the excessive self-restraint required to practice Theravada Buddhism properly, um, it just it can just cause this like neurotic outbursts in people and so forth. And uh, it was it happened in California, which uh, I mean is sort of the cap the, the American mecca of like just weird behavior anyway. But uh, I'm just sort of rambling all over the place because I really don't have like this structured description or explanation of Tom Pelusiato. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I mean, mainly he was just a simple, I mean, he was not an intellectual. He was just a simple practitioner who took it very seriously and got quite a following. Although the Tom Pulu tradition is now in relatively severe decline. There are a few famous disciples of Tom Pulu Seattle or disciples of disciples of Tom Pulu Seattle that are still high profile in Burma but uh, like Chelsin Doya which was the monastery where I started I was I was staying it was the, the main Tom Pulu monastery where I stayed it's uh, my my teacher venerable Chelsin Doya Seattle <clears throat> he died and uh, he was replaced by kind of a scholar monk who really was not a serious or a, like a really deep practitioner. And uh, I think most most Burmese people can kind of pick up on that. You know, they can, they can, they've got a good nose for saintliness. And so uh, yeah, it's 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 in decline now. I think there might be one Western monk who is technically ordained in the Tongpu tradition who is still in robes. And uh, he was a follower of the Mahasi method from the beginning. He really never did follow the Tongpulu method much. He just was ordained in the tradition and then just kept following the, the Mahasi method. So I guess that's the story. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I really don't know that, that much <laughs> about Tongpulu Seattle, to tell you the truth. It's like one of my, his, his teachings that is one of my favorites is just the, the simple his simple advice on how to practice better, which is eat less, sleep less, read less, talk less. And uh, he did all four of those. And also the Tom Pulu tradition was famous for Tom Pulu monks never lying down. They sleep in a sitting position. Although I eventually started lying down just because in blazing hot central Burma, it's the coolest way to be is just spread eagle on your back on a cement floor. Anything you lean back against just gets foul with sweat. So I guess that's a good enough story of the founder of my ordination lineage, I guess. 
<clears throat> so I'll just move on to Pranav's next question. I'm just sort of getting my stride. It's sort of like uh, Somerset Mom, his short stories. It's weird how he's sort of like a carpenter who's not very good at cutting wood, apparently, so that at first when you're using a handsaw, it kind of moves from side to side until you get the groove going. That's kind of like how I'm starting this, this Q&A. It's, it's moving, the blade is moving side to side until the groove gets cut, but I'm getting there. So, Pranav's next question here is, and you believe that St. John of the Cross could be enlightened. If that's so, did he follow something like Noble Eightfold Path? Because the Buddha said anyone outside the Buddha Sasana can be enlightened if they have Noble Eightfold Path. Well, I mean, first of all, I would just say that, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, if not absolutely impossible, to know for sure what the Buddha said because there are so many words attributed to the Buddha in the texts that are unlikely to have been said by him. And it's a common mistake to just assume that the obviously weird stuff, it was not said by him, but the sensible sounding stuff was very likely spoken by him. But you would think that a lot of the sensible sounding stuff can, could be fake too. So I'm, I'm sorry to like uh, rain on people's faith-based parade, but um, it is good to be skeptical to some degree. But uh, getting back to the question here, see, if that is so, did he follow something like the Noble Eightfold Path? Well, I mean, he was a serious contemplative monk in uh, counter-reformation Spain, like 16th century Spain. And so they had very strict practice and um, in some ways stricter than Buddhist monks, in some ways less strict. But um, yeah, I, I would say that with regard to moral restraint and also with regard to meditation and mindfulness, that it was comparable to what uh, a Theravada Buddhist monk practices. So, I mean, you could say that he didn't have right view because he was a Roman Catholic and he revered the Virgin Mary. I think, if I remember correctly, his favorite book of the entire Bible was the Song of Songs, which is rather risque love poetry. Um, so he probably didn't have right view at the superficial level, but when you're in a state of deep contemplation, you're not thinking anything, and that's when you're having your most profound realizations, is when you're not thinking anything. So when you're not thinking anything, all the superficial differences in dogmas uh, becomes largely irrelevant. So, yeah, I mean, he was very moral. He was, he was a genuine saint. He wasn't just a saint because he happened to uh, be on the winning side of a debate or some such. There are, there are saints that are called saints that really were not saintly people at all, like Saint Cyril of Alexandria was just an awful person but um, St. John of the Cross was definitely a saintly person and a wise person and also a meditation master and very moral person and just, you know, forgiving his enemies and, and doing all the things that Christians and Buddhists are supposed to do. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Om. And Om says, how was your vacation? Well, my vacation was fine. It was, it was nice. It was kind of strange that we picked the middle of January to go to Lake Erie, where it was, I mean, it never got above freezing the whole, the whole time we were on vacation. And it got down to about three degrees, which uh, is the coldest weather I've experienced since I was in Anchorage, Alaska around the year 1990, where it was like 25 below zero. But um, yeah, it was, it was nice, it was pleasant. Um, but that leads to the second part, or the second question from Om, which was, have you met your dog again? And unfortunately, I didn't get to meet Genghis. I mean, that was, that was a disappointment for me. I was, I was looking forward to seeing my dog again. And the thing was, it was such wintry weather that the farm where he lived had the power out. And it was just hard to get there. And so we wound up not going. There was a number of things that we were, had planned to do and because of the weather, it just didn't work out. We were going to go to the Toledo Aquarium also, which was closed. And uh, there was some art exhibit that my sweetheart's mama wanted to see. And then that one didn't work out either. 
So, so unfortunately, I didn't get to see my dog this time. I hope next time I will get to see Genghis again, and there will be the tearful reunion and wagging of tails and so forth. Um, so yeah, the vacation was fine. It was, it was a restful vacation. It was a nice vacation. The trip back was somewhat less restful, but, um, uh, all in all, it was a good vacation. So I think I'll just move on to the next question here. And this is from, you know, I'm with it. And you know, I'm with it says, what are your thoughts on Thomas Sowell? And I'm going to look and make sure that this thing is recording because I've had bad experiences with doing an entire Q&A and then have it not record. <clears throat> but it looks like it's recording. And I trust it, more or less. So, back to you know I'm with it's question here. What are your thoughts on Thomas Sowell? Seems like the woke people's worst nightmare. Most people I'm associated with are entangled in woke narratives. So I'm looking for non-Buddhist ways of deconstructing cultural Marxism and pointing out the reality of things, not the rhetoric of how things should be. Um, I really don't have a lot of exposure to Thomas Sowell. I mean, he's he's a, a black conservative, which makes him pretty much satanic from the point of view of the hysterical left. I mean, if there's one kind of person they hate more than a white conservative, it's a black conservative. You know, like Larry Elder, who has run for president at least once, ran for governor of California at least once. And I know more about Larry Elder than about Thomas Sowell. Um, I mean, he's just, you know, the black face of white supremacy and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they really don't know, like, the progressive left, you know, the hysterical faction of the progressive left, which is a goodly sized faction within the progressive left. Um, they just don't know how to deal with black conservatives or black people who just don't follow along with what they're supposed to follow along with, which is leftism, you know, the, the free stuff. And uh, I mean, they just, they just lose it a lot of the time. They just, they seriously, I think like people like Thomas Sowell and Larry Elder and Clarence Thomas and you know, high profile, intelligent, successful black men in the West who nevertheless are conservative, you know, they vote Republican. It's just like they're abomination. It's like they should not exist. I mean, I'm sure that there are lots of hysterical leftists who just think that, you know, people like that should not exist. Of course, they think anyone who doesn't agree with them should not exist. So, yeah, getting back to the question, what are my thoughts on Thomas Sowell? Um, yeah, I don't think I would agree with him on, any, on everything. Like, I think that he completely rejects or largely, you know, mostly rejects any kind of genetic component in, like, cognitive skills and so forth, which I would not. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's... Uh, He's very eloquent, very well-spoken, very articulate, and he can explain conservatism and intelligent, you know, reasonable language. But intelligent, reasonable language isn't going to work very well for, you know, pointing out the reality of things to people that just don't want to know that stuff. So, I guess I sort of answered that question. I really don't know that much about Thomas Sowell. I've read, you know, a few articles and I've seen them on YouTube a few times, but not really enough to, uh, you know, make any kind of authoritative judgment on the man. But I wish him well. And so I'm going to move on to uh, the next question, which is from Tiggles. And Tiggles says, whatever happened to humble stature? Well, some of you may recall that I was uh, interviewed by a man that called himself humble stature and I got involved in, I think it was called the spiritual right that was organized by humble stature. And the problem with, with humble stature is he could not stick with a plan. He was just continually changing his plans, you know, just kind of changing direction of what he wanted to do until finally the rest of the group just kind of fell away. And last I heard, he, was, uh, he had been, uh, gotten a job as a firefighter. 
which is an um, admirable profession. And uh, I don't think he's writing or doing videos with regard to <clears throat> like uh, conservative or right-wing spirituality anymore. And he really wasn't particularly right-wing anyway, it seems to me. But um, yeah, he, he's still fine. It's just that uh, he just changed his plan and uh, is no longer doing what he was doing when I was doing it with him. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from the Arya Swasti Project. And the Arya Swasti Project said, says, can you explain the difference between rebirth and reincarnation? And it's strange that a lot of Buddhists are sticklers. You know, they insist that it's not reincarnation, it is rebirth. Because supposedly, reincarnation implies that there is like a, a soul that, you know, reincarnates. But I don't see why that wouldn't apply to rebirth also. I mean, the re means again, so it's like the same thing is going into another life, which is what the Buddhists are taking issue with. So I think it's just kind of a strange, like almost like a fashion, you know, it's, it's just, it's just the way it's done in Buddhism that you say rebirth instead of reincarnation when really, I mean, it doesn't really matter much to me. I mean, reincarnation means again into meat, you know, the carn is like chili con carne, like carnivore. So again, you're once again entering meat, whereas rebirth just means you're born again. But, I mean, if you're not a materialist and don't believe that meat is real, then maybe rebirth would be more appropriate, especially for like Mahayana Buddhists who, <clears throat> they're not much into, into meat anyway. So, yeah, I mean, I, I use reincarnation sometimes just because more people would understand the term and essentially they're synonyms. I really don't see that there's any major difference. A rebirth could just as easily imply that there is some soul or, you know, permanent entity that's, you know, getting born again, because that re at the beginning of both words just means again. So, yeah, it's just sort of a, a strange, if there is any really good, reasonable reason why Buddhists so many Buddhists insist on saying rebirth instead of reincarnation. I don't know what it would be. It's just uh, the way it's done in Buddhism, apparently. So I'm just going to move on to the next question here. This is from White Ash Piper. And White Ash Piper says, What materials are your alms bowl made of? Until you pointed it out as to what it is, I assumed it was a meditation bell. And my alms bowl is that, that black object up there on top of the bookcase and uh, it is made out of iron according to the rules of monastic discipline for Theravada Buddhist monks an alms bowl must be made of clay or iron and mine is made out of iron and uh, I've been told that it was previously owned by Paul Seattle so it's kind of a prestigious kind of alms bowl if anybody knows and respects Seattle but um, I think originally all alms bowls were made out of clay because there are so many rules including in the Padimoka with regard to how carefully you have to handle the bowl you're not allowed to open or close the door with the bowl in your hand because it might hit against the door and break you're not allowed to hang your bowl on a peg because it might fall down and break you're not allowed to uh, put your bowl on like a high shelf or even on top of a table. You're supposed to put it on the floor underneath your bed or underneath the table um, just so it won't fall off and break. There's a strange rule that you have to have so many finger widths of cracks in the bowl before you can get a new bowl, which isn't going to happen with, with an iron bowl. So I assume that originally all alms bowls, like in the Buddhist time, were made of baked clay, you know, just an earthenware kind of a bowl. And that gradually before the, uh, the Tepitaka was finalized, before it reached its final form, iron came into fashion, iron bowls came into fashion. You know, it was the Iron Age and iron was becoming gradually more common for objects other than weapons. And so it's, it's so much more convenient having an iron bowl than a clay one. I remember one time I was traveling 
and somebody offered me a clay bowl that was bigger than that and that bigger than that and it holds i mean that one there holds more than a gallon and this was like a big one kind of like some tie bowls are really big and it was already at the time about a hundred years old and i just told them i mean if you give this bowl to me it's not going to live to see 101 because i've dropped let's see which hand that bowl more than once i've had to knock the dents out of it you know it's like you're you're walking home you're walking back to the cave or whatever during the rainy season you have to walk on like slick you know algae covered rocks and you just slip and the bowl just hits the rock and makes this loud clang so there's a few a few dents in that one but uh one one kind of issue is that most thai monks don't use iron bowls or clay bowls anymore they use stainless steel bowls and they don't bother to, to bake them black you know they're usually still like a silvery color and you can say that iron is the main ingredient of stainless steel at least most stainless steel but um still i've people offered me stainless steel bowls i just refuse you know it says clay or iron and that is definitely iron in that that bowl up there so that's what it's made out of and it's also baked black yet you, you you take i mean if anyone who's got my essays in theravada buddhism no i've got a chapter on how to bake a bowl and uh, you you take sesame oil and you cook it until it's like black sludge. And then you smear the iron bowl with this like burnt sesame oil. And then you bake it over a fire and it hardens like enamel. That's like what they did back before they had paint, like spray paint <clears throat> in ancient India. You'd make a kind of enamel out of uh, sesame oil. And so th that's why it's black, because it's been smeared with sesame oil and baked over a fire. So I guess I answered that one. Yeah, I mean, the, the, two, the only two ingredients of that bowl are iron and burnt sesame oil. So I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Mr. Shunryax. And Mr. Shunryax says... What's easier, working a nine to five with a girlfriend or being a monk? And that's a good question. Um, it depends on what you're going for. I mean, with regard to what's easier, it's like, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, I remember once having a Burmese monk tell me that it's easy to be a monk. And then I responded, well, it's easy to be a bad monk, but it's very difficult to be a good monk. Because if you're trying to live up to the ideals of how a monk should be that are found in the Pali texts, then it is a Herculean task. It's extremely difficult, and most people, even if they try as hard as they can, couldn't do it. Whereas working a nine-to-five job with a girlfriend, um, you know, absolute perfection is not really expected of you anyway. Um, so for me, working a nine-to-five with a girlfriend is it's more strenuous i mean it takes kind of more out of me physically because i you know i gotta work for a living but um yeah it was it's more difficult to be a, a serious conscientious monk than it is to be a serious conscientious employee and and mate at least in my case and my dog is looking at me he's a very nice dog part gremlin she's like a mutant gremlin so i guess i've answered that question working a nine-to-five job with a girlfriend um in a way spiritually um being a lay person is a higher difficulty setting setting than being a monk because the monk's life is set up to facilitate making spiritual progress but um just uh doing one's duty as a lay person is easier at least for me than doing one's duty as a monk because you got higher, more difficult duties as a monk. So I guess I'll move on to the next question. This is from Lieberlam. And Lieberlam says, if there was a machine that, you, that could make you live a better life based on complex moral calculations, and this made ethics more competitive. I'm not sure what he means by competitive. 
Would you choose to find some independent way of living your life, assuming it would make you categorized as criminal, evil, insane, inconsiderate of others, and an egomaniac? This under the basis of you being able to plug in or unplug like in the Matrix movies. You get one choice, and all the world is all intense about your choice, like it makes you a terrorist to, bla- to break from the flock. And the, first, the top part of this question here, a machine that would make you live a better life based on complex moral calculations. That reminds me of, um, it's a, a, a novella by Dostoevsky. I think it's Notes from Underground. And the guy, the, the protagonist, in a way he's like a damned soul. He's, I mean, he, he deliberately does what he knows is wrong just out of this perverse desire to do what is wrong. And he explains kind of why he does this. And he's talking about socialism, which was already a thing in Dostoevsky's time, you know, mid 19th century Russia, just mid 19th century Europe. Socialism was all the rage. Even before Marx came along, there were already, there were already socialists and communists that were um, coming up with this idea that you know communism is the enlightened, civilized way to live. You know, back then they didn't have a century of failed and or stagnant economies, totalitarianism, and genocide to look back upon. But anyway, um, according to the protagonist in, in this story by Dostoevsky, um, the socialists have this ideal of turning morals or ethics into a kind of science. Spinoza had a similar idea, but that's irrelevant here. And so they'd have like, you know, back then they'd have charts. Now you'd have a computer program. But in the story, which is you know, mid 19th century, you know, they'd have these charts where, you know, it would be worked out for you what you should do under any circumstance. You know, what is the most moral thing to do under these circumstances? You know, you plug in the numbers or whatever, and you look on the chart and it tells you what to do. And it seemed to him that that was a kind of death. I mean, you're no lo- you no longer have any semblance of free will because the chart is deciding for you what to do. And so in a way, it's just a kind of slavery to doing what is right. And so it was like he would rebel against that just to assert his individuality and his aliveness. I mean, that was kind of his, his reason, or at least a reason, why he was so perverse and doing the wrong thing all the time. He was like rebelling against this, you know, it was like this obligation that you have to do what is right, which means you no longer have any creativity, any imagination, any individuality. You just, you know, you're just a cog in the machine, just, you know, obeying the chart. And yeah, I mean, personally on my own, I think I would rather just not do that. I mean, I make my own decisions and follow my own conscience. But I mean, I'm in a relationship with a woman who cares more about what other people think and like what my social standing is. I mean, to make myself a despised pariah in a relationship with another person, that would definitely add a, a, a serious complication to fierce individualism and just insisting on following one's own conscience whenever one was in the mood to follow one's own conscience, that is. So, yeah, I mean, I'd have to wait for it to happen and uh, hash it out with my, my sweetheart who, as I say, might um, agree in theory, but nevertheless might disapprove of my becoming a social outcast and pariah and let's see, what is it here? Be considered by, yeah, be considered a terrorist and everything, socially ostracized and all that, lose my job, that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think she would approve of that much. So, yeah, that would be a, but if if I were on my own, probably I would just take the hit, just martyr myself, because that's just the kind of person I am. You know, if everybody is doing it this way, I'm going to do it some other way. So, I guess I answered that question as well as I am able. Therefore, I will move on to the next question, which is from RPAD, RPAD. I'm not sure what RPAD signifies here, 
But RPAD says, why did the Ajivaka practice asceticism if they were fatalists? What's the point of asceticism beyond, quote, I am an ascetic because it's my fate to be so, whether or not this makes any difference, unquote, which any fatalist can say to justify his own way of life. Well, to the Ajivakas, it does make a difference because only when you're at the end of your 84,000 or however many lifetimes you have to go through, um, in, in the Buddhist texts, they compare the Ajivaka's idea of determinism or fatalism as like a ball of string that you throw and roll across the floor and it just unwinds until you get to the end of it and the, the ball of string is gone. You know, it's just all unrolled. And that's kind of the way the Ajivakas saw, you know, living life after life after life until you reach the end of the ball of string and that's it. And the end of the ball of string is being an Ajivaka ascetic. So if you're not an Ajivaka ascetic, it, in, it indicates that you still got a long way to go. So if you want to be at the end or you want to, you know, like prove that you're at the end or near the end, you have to be an Ajivaka ascetic. That's the way they viewed it. You know, it was just, if you're an Ajivaka ascetic, it indicated that, especially if you were a, you know, like a conscientious Ajivaka ascetic who was doing what Ajivaka ascetics are supposed to do, then that indicated that you were towards the end. So if you want to be at the end, or you want to like prove to yourself and to others that you are, you know, near the end of the the eighty four thousand or however many lives, then you're you become an Ajivaka ascetic. You know, as a way of proving to yourself and to others that you're there. Because, I mean, if you're if you're not an Ajivaka ascetic, that is proof that you're not near the end of that ball of string so yeah it's in a way it's kind of some people they they, they don't can't really wrap their heads around fatalism like the idea well if if it's my destiny to win an olympic gold medal then i don't have to work out because it's my destiny i'm just going to get the olympic gold medal anyway but it doesn't work that way if you are destined to win an Olympic gold medal, by that same token, you are destined to train and train and train and train until you're puking sometimes to in, just, you know, go all out in order to get that Olympic gold medal or, or whatever it is, whatever the exalted goal is that you are destined to achieve, that you're also destined to work your ass off to get there. And that's kind of the way the Ajivikas uh, saw their fatalism that, I mean, if you're going to reach the end of existence, then you have to be an Ajivaka ascetic to do that. And so they're, in a way, they're taking their destiny in their own hands, sort of. But destiny and fate are kind of hard to wrap your head around sometimes. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Toronto Nat. And Toronto Nat says, is there anything wrong with being a Budo Christian syncreticist? Attending liturgy, confessing sins before a priest, taking communion, etc., while maintaining a Buddhist ethical and contemplative practice. If there is something wrong, what are the consequences of said wrongdoing? Well, I mean, Buddhism syncretizes with other spiritual systems fairly easily, like... For example, Chinese Buddhism was a kind of syncretism of Indian Buddhism and Taoism, although I've also read that, that um, Lao Tzu, um, who was supposedly the founder of Taoism, was just a, like a distortion of, of Gautama Buddha. He was sort of a legendary figure that was really based on Gautama Buddha anyway. But in Japan, Buddhism is syncretized with, with Shinto, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, that Buddhism was like combined with the indigenous like shamanistic practices that were prevalent in in uh, Tibet, even in Burma, that Buddhism to some degree has been syncretized, if that's a word, with the pre-Buddhist Burmese Nat cult, which is a kind of uh, worship of small G gods. And even the Greeks who, who uh, lived in northwestern India in ancient times because of Alexander the Great conquering northwestern India um, 
they converted to Buddhism, but still they kept their their Greek paganism also. So it was a syncretism of Buddhism and Greek paganism. Like there, some of the ancient coins, they'd have the Buddha on one side of the coin and Athena or some other Greek deity on the other side of the coin. So, yeah, Buddhism is now being syncretized with cultural Marxism in the West, which is not a good syncretism because cultural Marxism is essentially spiritually bankrupt. But, um, yeah, I mean, there would be some dogmatic or doctrinal issues. You know, Christianity says there is a supreme God. Buddhism says no. Christianity says there is an immortal soul. Buddhism says no. Um, so, I mean, there's going to be doctrinal issues that you're going to have to work out somehow. And uh, it may be that um, the priest that you're confessing your sins before might uh, consider heresy to be somewhat of a problem. If, that is, you're, you're adopting any Buddhist doctrines at the expense of Christian ones. But, uh, yeah, it seems like whatever civilization or society that Buddhism enters, it just gets mixed in with what's already there. And so, yeah, there's, it's uh, inevitable that there's going to be a lot of combination Buddhist Christians out there. And uh, so long as it works, I mean, so long as it helps you to be a, a wiser, better, happier person, then it, it's certainly not all bad. So I guess I answered that question. So I'll just move on to Toronto Nat's next question. And this is kind of a juicy one, kind of a spicy one. He says, there have been some very serious allegations made by some users on R Buddhism. And I, I assume slash R slash Buddhism means Reddit. So there's like a Reddit Buddhism thread or something. And uh, now I've, I'm just kind of sidetracked myself, so I'm going to start again. There have been some very serious allegations made by some users on R Buddhism against Panyo in the not too distant past, specifically concerning sexual abuse. How should we view and respond to such accusations? I think I might have actually seen that thread. My sweetheart noticed it and pointed it out to me and I just kind of ignored it. Because <laughs> I've, I've seen worse. Um, I've seen somewhere someone was accusing me of being like defrocked, excommunicated, just kicked out of the monkhood for molesting boys. And I mean, they didn't even know that you can't be kicked out of the monkhood, at least technically, it just doesn't work that way. They just, they just made that one up just based on a combination of hate and dishonesty, apparently, because I wasn't kicked out of the monkhood. I wasn't kicked out of any monasteries either. And I think this thread in Reddit was saying that I was kicked out of monasteries for being a sexual predator, but I was never kicked out of any monastery. I mean, I was told that no Ajahn Chah monastery would want me, or at least some Ajahn Chah monasteries wouldn't accept me, but I wouldn't want to live at Ajahn Chah monastery anyway. I did look into staying at Birkin in uh, British Columbia when I first came back to America in 2011 before any kind of scandals or anything happened. And uh, they wouldn't take me just because I wasn't ordained in the, the Ajahn Chah tradition anyhow. So I can say that as far as I know, the only really derogatory information about me that is factual, that is out there, is based on what I myself have personally admitted. You know, I, make, I made some admissions on my blog that um, people just distort and twist and exaggerate and then they, they like come back. It's sort of like that the game where you whisper into somebody else's ear and they whisper into somebody else's and they whisper into somebody else's and by the time you get to the end. It's a very different story from the first thing that was whispered into the first person's ear. So, I mean, it's like leftist Buddhists, some of them anyway, thoroughly disapprove of a Buddhist who isn't a leftist, especially if he's in the West. And so they just have this bias and it's like motivated by hate, essentially, and a little bit of dishonesty if, they, if they're the ones that are distorting it. 
and I mean, it just happens a lot where, you know, you hear a story and you have a certain bias, a certain spin, a certain take on it, and then the, the details get changed in accordance with the kind of your attitude. But I can say that the, the, the derogatory factual stuff about me originates from what I myself have publicized. You know, I, I myself have admitted to certain things that I've done in the past, nothing like excommunicate You know, I didn't, didn't do any of the four parajikas, but I did things that were arguably inappropriate for a monk. And I did uh, also on my blog that it's like the previous blog that no longer exists. I did say that if I ever wanted to do such things again, I would uh, disrobe first, which is what I did. So, yeah, the, the things that uh, they have exaggerated were things that, um, you know, I did the penance, you know, did the required penance and just put it behind me and promised I wouldn't do it again, and I didn't. So, yeah, the very serious allegations about sexual abuse or sexual predation and so forth, it's based on a nucleus of what I publicly admitted to and then it just got exaggerated and twisted by people with an axe to grind. And the, the part about me being kicked out of the monkhood or kicked out of the monasteries and so forth is just false. Because I wasn't kicked out of the monkhood or kicked out of any monasteries. I left of my own volition for my own reasons. So I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Raphael. And Raphael says... Ajahn Mahabua said 10 years ago that there are only 2% of monks left and that the rest have no virtue and no dhamma. As an example, he said that nowadays monks eat with spoons and no longer with their hands. Why do you think he gave this seemingly unimportant example and did you as a monk only eat with your hands? Well, I usually use the spoon. Uh, sometimes if I didn't have a spoon handy, like I lost my spoon or just misplaced it or something, maybe I was traveling and just forgotten to bring my spoon, I would eat with my hand. It's, I mean, I know how to do it. There is a way of eating with your hand where you, you, know, you scoop it up and then you kind of shape it into a little ball with your hand and then you, you kind of put it on these two fingers and use your thumb as like an ejector. You know, you get it to your mouth and use the thumb ejector to get it into your mouth. So I know how to do it, you know, like the traditional ancient Indian way of making rounded morsels. I mean, there's a rule of discipline saying that, you know, I will eat rounded morsels, which is, I mean, that's what it, that's what it implies is, you know, you, you kind of make it into a, a little round ball with your, with your fingers and your thumb before putting it into your mouth. Um, why Ajahn Mahabua like singled out this, I don't know. It's like the ties are really some of them are real sticklers for monastic discipline. Like, um, there's a famous story of Ajahn Man, who is another, another one of these, you know, renowned for being a very, um, essentially an arahant in Thailand, who met with the Buddha, which is, I mean, it, supposedly that would be impossible because the Buddha no longer exists in this world. But anyway, the Buddha came to him or he went to the Buddha and he he was able to ask him one question and the one question that Ajahn Mun asked the Buddha when he could ask any question is what is the proper color for monks robes and then of course the Buddha said essentially the same color that Ajahn Mun preferred wearing so I mean it could just be this weird um, almost like an OCD attitude towards even the, the really um, essentially trivial rules of discipline, although a, a really strict monk would say no rules are trivial, you know, it's better to die than to break even the minor, most minor rules. But still, I mean, it would make more sense to say that, you know, most monks are handling money now instead of most monks are eating with a spoon. I mean, a lot of monks don't even use their alms bowl anymore. I was, I stated a, I visited a Sri Lankan monastery in California and they knew that I ate out of my bowl. So as a way of sort of 
honoring me as a guest, they were all eating out of their bowls too. And the abbot was surprised. It's like, well, this is easy. This is, this works good. He'd never eaten out of a bowl before. He was, he was a Terra. He was a senior monk, but he'd never eaten out of an olive bowl before. So, I mean, I do agree with Ajahn Mahabua in his uh, statement that, you know, only 2% of monks are like legitimate monks who are actually trying to follow Dhamma correctly, Dhamma and Vinaya. But I would point out just uh, mainly as an example, just the handling money part. I mean, another good way of sort of separating the sheep from the goats, like a litmus test, just how you can distinguish between strict monks and loose monks. This, this isn't as accurate as the handling money, but just do they cover both shoulders when they're in public? And usually the unconscientious, lax, sloppy monks, they'll just go with one shoulder bare and they don't care. Whereas other monks um, that are more strict will cover both shoulders. But then again, some of the really sloppy monks will cover both shoulders just to make people think that they're not sloppy monks. So, yeah, it's, it's just a weird tie thing for being sticklers with regard to, you know, really m minor rules, lesser and minor rules. I guess there's even a, a sutta. Um, I don't know if this is directly from the sutta or in the commentarial story about the sutta, but there was a, almost a schism. There was like this, this controversy going on in the Buddhist time between the, the two factions of monks in, in the same monastery. And it was over something like leaving the water cup in the in the bathroom or something. You know, it was some some really minor trivial thing that just caused this uproar with almost like a schism going on. So I mean, that sort of thing has happened. Um, I used to be very strict with regard to the rules of monastic discipline. Also, like I mentioned earlier, that it's against the rules to open or close a door with a bowl in your hand, with your alms bowl in your hand. And so for years, I just went through this ridiculous ritual, even though my bowl was iron and wouldn't break by bumping against the door, you know, you set the bowl, first yet, you, you can't even set it down directly onto the ground because that's a different rule. You have to set it on a bowl stand or a piece of cloth or something. Then you open the door, then you pick your bowl back up again, take the bowl stand or the cloth with you, and then you go through the door. Mosquitoes are going in and out at the same time this door is open because you're in the tropics. And then you have to set the bowl back down on the bowl stand or the piece of cloth, and then you close the door, and then you pick the bowl back up and you continue on your way, which is just ridiculous. So, I mean, there, there are all these rules that, I mean, a strict monk will practice them religiously, literally religiously, um, just because there are rules. And, I mean, it's not entirely blameworthy. I mean, you can say that they're anal retentive or they're just, you know, clinging to this minor trivial stuff but still, at least they're conscientious, you know, at least they're trying to do their duty as a monk and trying to do it right. And so uh, better too strict than too lax. When you got a monk that just doesn't give a shit and just breaks rules and, you know, he just considers monks that are strict to, to just be, you know, just foolish. You know, they're just foolish dogmatists or whatever. And I won't name any names, but there are some Western monks that are kind of that way. You know, they'll just scoff at monks that are more strict than they are. Just saying, you know, they're just, you know, clinging to, to rites and rituals and so forth. But still, it's better to be too strict than too lax. But um, there really is no rule that I'm aware of <laughs> against eating with a spoon. So, I mean, that's not even rules of monastic discipline. That's just like an ancient tradition that, you know, it's not even a rule that you have to do that have to eat with your hand or it's against the rules to eat with a spoon because it's just not it's not in there maybe you know nobody even thought of making a rule against it because it was just the tradition for monks to eat with their hand like a lot of people still do in Asia eat with their hand so yeah it's just idiosyncrasies of Thai culture and maybe of Ajahn Mahabua himself so I'll just move on to the next question this is from Andreas and Andreas says, Would you say that Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations of the Pali Canon are trustworthy and good, as he comes from a certain subversive tribe? And by looking at his political agenda, that flows through sometimes. I have my doubts. Nyanaponika Mahatera 
was also a member of this tribe, apparently, quite suspicious that the most prominent translators come from the same religious background. What is the best English translation that is available at the moment in your opinion? Well, I've never heard that Venerable Nyanaponika was one of God's chosen. Maybe he was, it just wasn't an issue. I mean, he did spend some time in a concentration camp, but it was a British concentration camp and not a German one because he was a German citizen who was ordained as a monk in Ceylon, as it was called in those days, which was a British colony in those days. So he had a German citizen on, in a British colony during World War II, so he was just essentially arrested and taken to like a concentration camp. It wasn't just Germans that had those. So whether Nyanaponika, I think he might have just been German. I'm not, I really don't know. But uh, he was a, a good translator of the Pali Canon into German, or so I've read. I, I don't speak or read German, so I can't really say for sure, but he has a good reputation for being a, a reliable translator into German. Um, but Bhikkhu Bodhi, um, I mean, his end notes can, can be political sometimes but he is a trustworthy translator. He's a very conservative translator, even if he's not conservative politically. So at least he's conscientious in that regard. So, yeah, I would say that Bhikkhu Bodhi is still possibly the best translator of Pali into English today, um, at least with regard to his translation style. With regard to deep philosophical stuff and like deep meditative stuff, I think Ajahn Tanisara would be more reliable because his, his knowledge of Buddhism is more based on his own practice, whereas Bhikkhu Bodhi is essentially a scholar who doesn't practice much, or at least he has a reputation for being a scholar who just doesn't or can't meditate. So, but then Ajahn Tanisara has his own idiosyncratic style that kind of interferes with good translation because a good translator should be as invisible as possible and when you're being idiosyncratic and self-indulgent in your choice of words and your your way of translating poetry and so forth then you're not being invisible and it's just you know sometimes Ajahn Tanisaro should just like write you know look at me here I am Ajahn Tanisaro translating this you know every few lines because that's kind of the impression that you get when you're reading it sometimes or at least that's the impression I would get sometimes. But again, going back to Bhikkhu Bodhi, he's a good translator. Um, you know, regardless of his politics, his translations are trustworthy. But um, if you want deep, I mean, he's, he's going to defer to the commentarial tradition most of the time because he doesn't have a whole lot of personal meditative experiences to, to rely on. And so he'll just defer to the commentarial tradition most of the time. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Mogambo. And Mogambo, this, this first part isn't really a question. It's just some feedback to an answer I gave to somebody else's question. Uh, I think it was C.O. Vaksh and Sipat Zidana in the previous Q&A was asking me about um, red-haired, red blue-eyed Brahmins in ancient India how it shouldn't, shouldn't have been that way because the Indo-Aryans apparently, you know, the original Indo-Aryans who invaded India, according to him, would not have blue eyes and, and reddish or fair colored hair. So anyways, Mogambo here gives his, his feedback saying, regarding the question asked by someone about Buddha being blue eyed or Brahmins being red haired, I think it depends upon the time when the sutras were being written down. It could be the kings in power who wanted to portray Buddha looking like themselves, just like Buddha statues look Asian in East Asia. The Kushanas might have had red hair and blue eyes, as the Tokarian mummies found in China had same features. Um, well, the Buddha is supposed to have one of the the 80 marks, the 80 lesser marks of a great, of a Mahapurisa or a great man is that his eyes would be Abhi Nila. And Nila usually means blue. And Abhi means like intensely or very. So um, one of the marks, this goes back to, you know, ancient India. 
is that his eyes would be intensely blue, although Nila also sometimes can mean jet black, and so it might be sort of a blue-black, sort of like Veronica's hair in the old Archie comics, where it would have blue highlights, something like that. Although, I don't think eyes work that way. Like, the irises of your eyes, black eyes, would just be, like, intensely dark, like black coffee. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, it wasn't with regard to Buddhists that the, the question was asked previously. It was with regard to Brahmins, like the stereotypical Brahmin. I read somewhere that was referring to Patanjali and a book that Patanjali wrote, which was the Yoga Shastras of the Yoga Sutras, I can't remember which, um, where he, he refers to the stereotypical Brahmin as having blue eyes and like ruddy colored hair. And I'm, I don't know how the Brahmins, who are like, like, with regard to their ethnicity, would be the most conservative of the, the castes and classes of, of Indians, especially the Hindus. Um, you know, like Kshatriyas and the lower, lower castes, the lower Varnas, um, could have a lot of influx of um, non-Aryan um, blood you know like like some tribal chieftain could be um you know he'd be honored with like honorary kshatriya status and some people think the buddha was like that where his family just had honorary kshatriya status without being aryan although that could be just a politically correct conjecture trying to make the buddha be you know a brown-skinned person so i mean regardless of that um, it is true that the Buddha looks, you know, he looks like the ethnicity of the people who made the statues or the paintings. That is true. And it also is true that the Kushanas who uh, ruled India or Northwest India um, after the Greeks did, um, they may have been Tokarian or largely Tokarian. They were like, what, Yue Qi or something like that in Chinese, which I think may have been Tokarian or largely Tokarian. And so, yeah, that's that's possible but uh, how they would become brahmins i don't know because the brahmins are the most conservative you know they, they most closely resemble the the ancestral indo-aryan invaders as far as as far as i can understand it <clears throat> you know they're the, they're the ones most resistant to you know out breeding you know or like you know mixing their blood with with other classes or ethnicities and so forth but I don't know. Anyways, that wasn't even a question. So the question from uh, Mogambo here is as follows. My question is about the left-leaning Buddhist. I have heard you say anyone can attain enlightenment even out of the Buddhist faith like some Indian gurus you have mentioned in the past. Why do you think the left-leaning Buddhist has to follow everything to the T if anyone can attain enlightenment I mean, in the end, no one can prove anything. There is no gauge to measure enlightenment. So that is true. There is no gauge to measure enlightenment. But if the leftist Buddhist is mainly practicing leftism and ignoring or rejecting most genuine Dhamma, which happens to be the case in a lot of cases, then, yeah, they're not even really practicing Dhamma other than, you know, a few elementary meditation techniques and you know, a little bit of jargon. I mean, that's a lot of, of Western Buddhists, so-called. I mean, that's really what their Buddhism consists of, is, you know, one or two elementary meditation techniques and some jargon. And m most of the rest of it is just progressive leftism, you know, cultural Marxism, whatever you want to call it. And cultural Marxism, to the extent that they're following that preferentially over following genuine Dhamma, then it's just not conducive to enlightenment. It's like becoming a Jehovah's Witness or something. Being a Jehovah's Witness might be very nice, but it does not strike me as being particularly wise or conducive to the cultivation of wisdom. So they might be really good at meta meditation towards people who agree with them. You know, they might have a lot of compassion towards, you know, oppressed minorities, but still to the extent that they are abandoning genuine dhamma in favor of like queer buddhism 
then I mean they're they're essentially abandoning genuine Dhamma. And I mean not everything in the text is really essential. I mean the fairy tales and the, the talking animals and a lot of the devotionalistic stuff, it's really you know, it's probably added later. It wasn't probably it doesn't probably originate with the Buddha himself. But a lot of stuff that probably did originate was from the Buddha himself, like no self or the the essential importance of renunciation and sense restraint, when that stuff is just blatantly rejected, and sometimes even they even want to change it, then yeah, I mean they're just they're just deviating from what the Buddha taught. They're deviating from genuine Dhamma and they're deviating from what is actually conducive to the cultivation of wisdom and ultimately to liberation. They don't even want that as a general rule. So I guess I answered that question. Now we're getting a real political Q&A this time. <clears throat> Although I don't think I've said anything really bad yet. But for those of you who want me to say something really bad, there's still hope we haven't got to the end of this yet. So the next question is from Nature Cure. And Nature Cure says, You say a lot. Sotapana, Sakadagami, Anagami probably doesn't exist or later added to suttas or something, but they mentioned too many times in all over suttas. That's really, really bad, bad news if that is true. You really need to make clear explanation to us with many facts. Otherwise, I'm going to have to continue working on my enlightenment from my Sotapanna level to Arahant. And then he's got a little smiley face after that. So I guess this isn't a question either. Man, that's, this is the second non-question I've read. But um, I guess it does, <clears throat> does call for some kind of comment. Um, yeah, I... I I have mentioned more than once, and, um, oh hi, my dog's saying hi to me. I've mentioned more than once, and uh, G.C. Pandey in his Origins and Studies of Buddhism agrees that the four stages of Aryahood, the four stages of sainthood in, the, in, the, in Buddhism, in Theravada Buddhism, probably did not originate with the Buddha himself. And one of, one of the bits of evidence he gives for that is that Sakadagamis are not mentioned at all in texts that otherwise give clear indications of being really old, like archaic. You know, they've got like archaic features in other respects. No mention of Sakadagamis in, in that. With regard to Sotapanas, apparently in the oldest texts, like in the the, uh, the Padimoka, that it's apparently referring not to a, a a sage who has glimpsed nirvana, but rather to just a new convert, like like somebody who is newly converted to Buddhism, and they're you know got stars in their eyes. They're very faith oriented. They're very enthusiastic. You know, they're embarking upon the the stream of, of dharma. Um, so there's it had a, a different meaning originally, according to my interpretation of it, although it's not like a just wildly opposite kind of a meaning. It's, it's a lot of overlap anyway. And anagami, one of the main bits of evidence that anagami had a different meaning originally is that the first several suttas of the Iti Wudaka, of the Kudaka Nikaya, uh, apparently, judging from the context, are using anagami in the sense of an arahant. So that anagami originally, according to the theory, was a synonym for the word arahant or enlightened being. And it does make sense. An anagami is one who just does not return. You know, that would indicate that they're not born again. They no longer come back to samsara. But then it came to mean that they go up into this high heaven realm for one last life. And then they become enlightened way, way up in this extremely high heaven realm, accessible only to Buddhists. So... I mean, it really is not that big of a deal. I mean, you shouldn't be striving to attain any particular stage. I mean, goal-oriented Dhamma is really, I mean, things just do not happen the way you expect them to. And so you get this idea in your head of what you want to attain, and it may be that the reality is very different from that. And it's, it, it can become counterproductive. 
and just goal oriented dharma is not really dharmic because I mean you should be in the present moment I mean you shouldn't be like practicing dharma in order to get something in the future you should be doing it for its own sake right now you know because it's your sacred duty to practice dhamma or because by practicing dhamma you're you're as close to enlightenment as you can get right now be here now so it's not really really bad news or really really bad bad news uh, if even if <clears throat> gc pande and i are correct in the assumption that the four stages of Aryahood did not originate from the Buddha, but were a later development in Buddhist doctrine. And there are a lot of later developments in Buddhist doctrine. But uh, whatever, I mean, however you practice, if it works for you, go right ahead. I'm sure there have been a lot of traditional Asian Theravada Buddhist monks and nuns who have you know, believed all the stuff, including the flat earth and the talking animals and so forth, and they've gotten high attainments. You know, it's like, Roman Catholic saints, some of them who believe, you know, they revered the Virgin Mary and all that, and they got high attainments too. Because eventually, the words in the books just become largely irrelevant. Because when you're in a deep contemplative state, you're not thinking in words anymore anyway. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Yuga U. And Yuga U asks kind of an interesting question here. Hello, can you please explain the mindset and karma of people who are impulsive hoarders? There are many animals in the world that show the same thing. Can it be related? Yeah, I think from a biological point of view, from a biological point of view, that I mean, there are certain areas in the brain that can condition hoarding and you know, if you get a glitch in that part of your brain, it can just cause you to be obsessed with hoarding, you know, old newspapers or, or whatever it is. You know, I've, I've, there's, there's been like TV shows about hoarders and uh, I've read about hoarders also in, in uh, various books. And yeah, it's, it's really a thing. There are some people that it's like, they can't bear to get rid of anything. They might have their house just completely packed full of this garbage and junk because they can't bear to part with anything. So from a biological point of view, you can, there'd probably be some kind of brain glitch. Um, but with regard to their karma, yeah, I'm not sure what the karma would be unless they were just very you know, possession-oriented people. You know, they just identified with what they owned, considered owning stuff to be very important or something. Maybe they were extremely poor and didn't own anything in a previous life and they were just like obsessing with owning lots of stuff or something. But yeah, it's, it's really hard to say what the karma exactly would be in a case like that. And probably different people would have different kinds of karma. Like some pe different people hoard different things for different reasons. You know, it might be the same general kind of brain glitch, but still, you know, the, like the subjective aspect of it could be significantly different from one person to the next. So I think I'll just move on to the next question. And this question, the first part of this question has already been answered. <clears throat> he says, also, if it's not too personal, how was your vacation? And then he says, are you in a good relation with your wife's mom? And yeah, I'm pretty sure that my sweetheart's mama hates me, but she really compensates a lot to not let it show by just being really sweet to me and, and like buying me clothes and like wanting to hug me and, you know, um, saying that she loves me and stuff. So it's, it's kind of complex. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question. Cause I already said how my vacation was. It was fine. Very cold and snowy, but fine. And if you're ever in Toledo, go to a restaurant called Mansi's. It's really nice. And so I'll just move on to the next question here. This is uh, from Personalization Primitive. And Personalization Primitive says, for individuals leading a family and shouldering responsibilities for their children with an obligation to invest their time in earning a living, complete renunciation may not be the most suitable path how can such individuals effectively pursue enlightenment 
while balancing their patriarchal and financial duties? Well, this is a very common question from Westerners. I mean, sometimes it's, it's not as thoughtful as this. It's like, how can we practice renunciation correctly without actually renouncing anything? Sometimes you know, I get questions like that. I was told once by a woman who lived at, um, oh, what's the place in Dharamsala in India where the, the Dalai Lama was staying. She was a translator and English teacher at Dharamsala for a while. And <clears throat> maybe just an English teacher. But anyway, she said that one time a Western man asked the Dalai Lama a question like this. I mean, it was more like the, the example I gave, the more extreme example of, you know, how can I practice renunciation correctly without actually renouncing anything? You know, it's like, how can I practice Dhamma correctly while still kind of wallowing in samsara? And he actually started crying, according to the, the lady that was there. And, uh, yeah, it, it is kind of a, a difficult situation if you're, you know, you're, you're pretty much you know, anchored into samsara by all these duties and obligations, and you still want to practice Dhamma correctly, um, yeah, I mean, you're just going to have to do it with a handicap of not being able to practice it entirely correctly. And how can individuals effectively pursue enlightenment while balancing their patriarchal and financial duties? Well, I mean, you can be living in the world like Uba Kin, who was S.N. Gwenka's teacher. He was like a government minister. Not like a Christian minister, but, you know, like a high-ranking administrator in the Burmese government. And still, he was a kind of meditation master. Um, it just has to be a very high priority. You know, you have to consider it to be very important. And also, just be mindful of whatever you're doing. And the dogs just flung the door wide open. Yeah, just, just be mindful in the present moment, no matter what you're doing, whether you're working or, or sitting cross-legged. If you're in the present moment, you, you, you can be here now and still, you know, follow your, your conscience, you know, do your ethical duty of, you know, not telling lies or stealing or that sort of thing. <clears throat> not wallowing in sensuality any more than, you know, duty bids. Then, uh, yeah, I mean, you can still make considerable progress that way. Nisargadatta Maharaj was considered to be enlightened and he was a householder who ran a little stall selling cigarettes and stuff in India. I mean, it is possible. Being a, a lay person is a higher difficulty setting for practicing Dhamma, but it's still possible, but you're not going to be able to practice it correctly as it is stated in the Pali texts. I mean, it's, it's always going to be... Uh, falling short to some degree since renunciation is pretty much basic like I was saying in the previous Q&A that the, the gradual practice taught by the Buddha begins with renouncing the world so I mean you're not going to be following ancient Indian tradition in your, in your efforts but you can still be I mean so long as like you're just driven to practice Dhamma and to know reality, you know, to, to just strive for liberation, then really you can do just about anything. So long as, you know, you've got like this burning, this ardent drive in you, then, I mean, that, that compensates for a heck of a lot. I think it was what Ramakrishna was saying that, I um, mean, he was a Hindu, so he was saying that, I mean, if if you just spontaneously burst into tears at the mere name of God, then you can do whatever you want. I mean, because you're just going in the right direction regardless of, you know, the commotion externally, you know, what your, what your meat puppet happens to be doing. But, I mean, you'd have to be really dedicated to being mindful and, and moral, especially. So I guess I answered that question, sort of, kind of. So let's move on to the next question here. This is from Rui. And Rui says, there is a contemporary temptation to conflate, excuse me, like belch. I'll start again. Rui says, there is a contemporary temptation to conflate sabe dhamma anatta with a scientific proclamation. For example, things are ultimately made of evanescent particles and temporary coalescence and thence are not self. 
when in fact Sobe Dhamma Anatta is a phenomenal phenomenological proclamation, i.e., it concerns the subject or the mode of view of the stream enterer's consciousness and what it accesses or experiences, and not the object or the world. Kant's Copernican revolution comes to mind here. Thoughts. Well, I think even in Theravada, it's not purely subjective when it says that, you know, sabe dhamma anatta, that all, all things are not self. For example, the, the simile of the chariot, which is one of the main explanations of, of uh, anatta in the, in the suttas, I mean, that's pretty much what he's describing here is the scientific proclamation that, you know, a chariot isn't, it's like a chariot is just made up of parts and you can swap out this part or that part and it's considered to be the same chariot. You know, it's like, where is the chariotness in this chariot? You know, it's just a convenient name that you give to a certain assemblage of parts and it's just kind of vague because, as I said, you can swap out certain parts. Certain parts can just go missing. You can break a, a spoke out of the chariot wheel and it's still considered to be the same chariot. You know, it's like you can get one of your fingers chopped off, God forbid, we don't want that to happen. But, you know, you lose a finger, you're still you. You're still considered to be the same person, just with nine fingers instead of ten. So, I mean, I think the Sabe Dhamma Anatta is just applicable across the board, you know, just from any perspective. You know, there is no valid perspective where there really is an ultimately real self, either subjectively or objectively. And, you know, Rupa Kanda is not self, too. But I guess, <clears throat> I guess that's just, I just flung that in there just because it occurred to me all of a sudden. So it is true that the Mahayana Buddhists put more emphasis on there is no objective self, whereas the, the Theravada Buddhists we're mainly emphasizing that there is no subjective self, but I mean, the subject is a subject for the object and the object is an object for the subject. I mean, you can't have one without the other because they dependently co-arise. Subject and object dependently co-arise. You can't have one without the other. And neither of them is self. Nothing is self. Not even Nibbana, according to Theravada. So, yeah. I mean, those are my thoughts on that. Although it is true that, as I said, the Mahayana Buddhists put more emphasis on um, applying anatta to objective reality as opposed to subjective reality. But, I mean, it's, as I just said, I mean, it applies to both. So I'll just move on to Rui's next question here. And I will add that everyone is being very very self-restrained in asking no more than three questions per episode, which is uh, appreciated. So anyway, Rui says, the Theravadan adherence to the notion of an ultimate partless particle, you got that in quotes, partless particle, which was also Democritus's atomistic vision, seems somehow deficient even from a strictly logical point of view for example, or i.e., said particle would, could always be divided in various parts, etc. Perhaps there is no soteriological value in discussing this point to exhaustion. This, this question itself is kind of exhausting. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've mentioned before that but at the time that Theravada arose in India, formal logic really had not taken root in India yet that it was sort of like a pre-Aristotelian kind of logic. And consequently, sometimes the attempts at logic in Theravada Buddhist philosophy fall short of what nowadays we would consider to be valid reasoning. And so even in Abhidhamma, they're, they're talking about the Dhammas, which are, in, in the context of Abhidhamma, it's like an ultimate reality, just this particle this indivisible particle of ultimate reality, which would be, you know, like earth element or wind element or, you know, perception or volition or nose sensitivity, or in other words, you know, like a, the olfactory sensitivity. You know, there's over a hundred of these ultimate realities. I, I think, if I remember correctly. So, but the thing is, 
they're, they always occur in what are called rupa kalapas, which are these little clusters of these individual um, uh, ultimate, ultimately real like elements. And the dogs are they're, they're like doting on me today because I was gone for a week, and so they're hang they want to hang out with me. Anyways, um, like for example, perception and volition are considered to be qualitatively different in Abhidhamma, but they always have to occur at the same place, at the same time, with the same object. And so, I mean, you can't have one without the other, but nevertheless, they're, they're two distinct entities. And there's, I can't remember how many um, elements have to be in, in the minimum size of a Rupa Kalapa, but I'm pretty sure it's at least six. And so, uh, because they couldn't possibly be separated in reality, already you've got this imagination that has to come in and separate them um, just mentally. Because in reality, supposedly, they can't be separated. But they are considered to be completely different. And I would consider something like perception and volition, I mean, just to be two different aspects of the same thing, two different, two different ways of looking at the same thing. Sort of like an object in its behavior. Uh, that was like the first philosophical essay I ever wrote as a Buddhist monk was mainly trying to, to hash out the relationship between perception and volition. How they're considered to be qualitatively completely different by orthodox Theravada Buddhist philosophy, i.e. Abhidhamma, but in reality it was just like a trick of the mind to consider them to be two different things. So um, yeah, I, I think I've just wandered completely away from this question here. The Theravadan adherence to the notion of an ultimate partless particle, which was also Democritus's atomistic vision, seems somehow deficient, even from a strictly logical point of view, i.e. said particle could always be divided into various parts, etc., but perhaps there is no soteriological value in discussing this point of exhaustion. And that's the only question mark, is at the end of that part. So in a way, this isn't even really a question either. I'm, there's, there's like these non-questions keep uh, sneaking in here. Perhaps there is no soteriological value in discussing this point to exhaustion. So soteriological value would be value for salvation or liberation. And yeah, I mean, ultimately there isn't. Like the entire Abhidhamma Pitaka, I'm sure lots of monks became enlightened without ever having heard of it back in ancient times. Um, you just don't need to know that stuff. Because, as I say, you get into the deep contemplative states, you're, you're not even thinking anymore anyway. So all this perceptions, concepts, become irrelevant. So let's move on to the next question here. And this is from uh, Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana. And Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana says, You have said having promiscuous sex is against the precepts, even if no one involved is married, but I couldn't find any textual backing. Can you please tell me what you are basing this on? And it is true that I cannot recall the exact location of statement that the Kamesu Michachara, you know, which is one of the, the five precepts, you know, the third precept is, you know, I undertake the precept not to indulge in sens sensual misconduct. Kamesu Michachara. Um, I think the standard definition is it just gives a list of the different kinds of women that you're not allowed to mess around with. Any woman who's already got a, a guardian or a mate or some, which is in ancient India was pretty much the same thing for a, a wife. I mean, she was like, you know, already had her husband was her guardian. You know, he was he was her uh, I don't know overseer. You know, and it's like a woman who was just a free agent was not on the list but almost all women were, um, you know, even a prostitute would, would have a pimp who was sort of like her master in, in a lot of cases. So, um, nevertheless, it was just common, common knowledge. I mean, as a monk, it was when, when Burmese monks would talk about uh, Kame Subichachara, I mean, it was pretty clear that having sex just for the purpose of sensual indulgence, simply for the purpose of gratifying lust, 
is just, is sexual misconduct or sensual misconduct. I mean, that's just common sense. So it is true that you don't have to be married with to a woman in order not to break the third precept that, um, you know, unlike Christianity where you have to be married before you can have sex, I mean, you don't literally have to be married. I mean, marriage is just a secular institution that has practically nothing to do with Theravada Buddhism anyway. You know, it's just considered to be a sort of a, you know, sort of a secular, just a cultural institution, almost arbitrary in a way. But, I mean, it's pretty clear just from anyone who understands Dhamma that promiscuous sex, just for the sake of hedonism, just for the sake of, you know, cheap jollies, just for the sake of you know, gratifying lust or wallowing in sensuality is not going to be approved of. That it's, it's going to be bad karma. I mean, you might be able to come up with some legalistic argument for justifying it, but it's not technically breaking the precept, but that is irrelevant because the karma, you know, is the same. The karmic quality of it is going to be the same. So, in order to avoid the third precept, you pretty much have to be in a monogamous, loving relationship. That just going after one woman after another, or one man after another, or having more than one at the same time, that, uh, I mean, that would be clearly in violation of the whole spirit of sensual restraint in Dhamma. But again, I do not know the exact source. I mean, it's, it's got to be in there somewhere. Somewhere in the commentarial tradition, if it's not in the suttas themselves. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I mean, the main thing I'm basing on is just common consensus among the Sangha as to what constitutes sexual misconduct or sensual misconduct. Kame su micha charm. But, yeah, I cannot refer to the exact text because I don't know what the exact text would be. So, I guess I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Romeo. And Romeo says, I'm new to Buddhism and was, and was wondering if or how we pass on insight meditation fits in with the original teachings. Did the Buddha incorporate we pass on into his meditation practice? Did he originate it? Um, I'm sure that we pass on, I mean, I don't, I'm not, this is kind of a tricky, a tricky issue. Uh, we, what is called Vipassana nowadays, I think, I've never liked the name Vipassana for it, because what is called Vipassana nowadays is essentially Satipatthana, or mindfulness meditation. Vipassana isn't something that you do. Vipassana is insight that spontaneously arises, generally as a result of your meditation. But the meditation is mindfulness, or Satipatthana, and personally, I much prefer um, mindfulness meditation being referred to as mindfulness meditation or Satipatthana than have it being called Vipassana. Because again, Vipassana isn't something that you do, it's something that arises spontaneously as a result of your meditative practice or your yogic practice. So, yeah, I mean, Satipatthana definitely was taught by the Buddha. And the insight that arises is just assumed. You know, it's, it's mentioned in the suttas also that you have like this liberating insight that arises as a result of your meditative experiences. So that's in the suttas. I mean, that goes all the way back to very ancient times. Um, whether the Buddha originated the concept of Vipassana, I kind of doubt it, but I mean, he is one of the best teachers of it that he emphasizes it more than most spiritual traditions or maybe possibly any other spiritual traditions. So, I mean, with regard to just mindfulness, what most people vulgarly call Vipassana, yeah, definitely the Buddha was teaching that. In fact, that was probably at least as important to a monk striving for enlightenment as sitting cross-legged in a state of jhana, just being mindful of every motion as, you know, everything that you do, you're doing it mindfully. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so 
the Buddha did incorporate Upasana into his meditation practice, um, or at least he was, his meditation practice was, the meditation practice that he taught was devised in such a way as to cause insight or vipassana to arise. But whether he originated it or not, I kind of doubt it, because I assume there's always been people that are very spiritually advanced, very spiritually mature, who come along, you know, like Pacheca Buddhas or previous Buddhas, you know, I mean, before the Buddha, even in Theravada Buddhism, there were people who had liberating insight. I mean, if you become enlightened, it's presumably because of liberating insight or vipassana. But, I mean, the way the vipassana insight knowledges are, like, put into a list. I mean, this is like in the commentarial tradition. It's not in the suttas, where you've got, in Burma, it's called nyanzin. It's like the list of, of vipassana insight knowledges that you have to experience in the correct order in order to become enlightened. And the Mahasi tradition is heavily reliant on this nyanzin. Like at Pandita Rama back when Upandita was alive, I don't know if it's still that way, um, pretty much all he cared about was, you know, you'd give your, your meditation interview and you'd be telling him your experiences and he'd just be listening. He, I mean, he, he wouldn't give a shit about most of what he said, but if you experienced something that was like on the, the correct order on the, on the, the list that we possibly insight knowledges, I mean, he'd perk up and might start writing stuff down, which... Um, was giving subtle cues to the meditators that that was the kind of thing that he wanted to hear. <sighs> but um, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, even vipassana, the use of the word vipassana is now really kind of confusing because what it means now was different from what it meant, what it means in the suttas, for example. Um, but I think I answered that question, so I think I'll move on to Romeo's next question here. And his next question is, I would also be interested in you conducting a guided, mind, a guided mindfulness meditation. So many of the ones I come across on YouTube come from practitioners that are steeped in the mind virus of today's cultural Marxism. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. It really is like, um, I mean, in a way it makes sense that conservatives in Western civilization are more likely to be Christian. And it's, it's the, the radicals or the leftists. You know, originally it was like the beatniks and the hippies are the ones that are going to be going for the, the esoteric, exotic Eastern spiritual traditions. And so it's just natural that in Western civilization, Western culture, you know, it's mostly leftists that are going to be interested in Buddhism. That's just the way it is. But nowadays, you know, after a few decades of relatively serious... Um, Buddhists, Western Buddhists who are taking things relatively seriously now it's, it's just gotten into the hands of you know, queer Buddhism and just all this you know, it's rainbow Buddhism or you've got these academics just writing about I mean, I've, I've gone over all this stuff before you know, it's, they're largely rejecting orthodox Buddhism as it is found in ancient texts and in ancient traditions and replacing most of it with essentially cultural Marxism. What, what goes by the name of cultural Marxism, call it progressivism, you know, hysterical leftism, whatever you want to call it. So that is, that is uh, an unfortunate fact. And my dog is just keeps pestering me. Bless her little heart. So the thing is, I mean, the, the main question here is, would I be interested in conducting a guided mindfulness meditation? And I do not like guided meditations. I mean, I've, I've never liked following guided meditations just because I don't like somebody telling me what to think. You know, somebody like invading your, the, the privacy of your own mind and telling you what to think. Um, yeah, I've never really liked that. And so just going with the idea of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, I've never liked giving guided meditations. So, I mean, you're better off just learning how to do mindfulness meditation and then sit there and do it like in silence, in solitude, 
you know, just sit there cross-legged on the floor or however it is that you do it. Learn how to do it, you know, find out from a, a reliable source like maybe the Satipatthana Sutta or a, a book based on the Satipatthana Sutta. <clears throat> um, you know, the experience of insight by Joseph Goldstein even is uh, a very good book, one of his first books, I think. Um, you know, just learn how to do mindfulness meditation and then just do it on your own. Um, at least if you do want to do a guided meditation, you're going to have to find somebody other than me to do it because I just don't like uh, giving or receiving guided meditations. So I think I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Keep the Vinaya. And Keep the Vinaya says, let us assume that bhikkhunis, he's got it, bhikkhunis in, in quotes, let us assume that bhikkhunis ordained by Mahayana nuns would be recognized by the Sangha. The proponents of bhikkhuni ordination would most likely advocate that the physically disabled can also be ordained. In your opinion, do the proponents of bhikkhuni ordination also have the chance to convince the Sangha on this issue? Um, in certain circles, I mean, they'll, they'll have the chance to convince leftist Sanghas of just about anything that is leftist. But um, with regard to physical disabilities, it's pretty clear uh, who can be ordained and who can't. There's a list of diseases that if you've got them, you're not supposed to be ordained. Um, certain physical disabilities, I mean, can be disqualifying for ordination. Some of them are not disqualifying, but nevertheless, it's a minor offense for the monks to ordain such a person. If they do ordain them, the, the ordination is valid, but still they may commit a minor offense. I mean, physical disabilities, um, yeah, I think that's pretty clear cut in the texts, you know, to what extent a person could be physically disabled and still be ordained. <clears throat> um, I have seen um, monks ordained that had leprosy and so forth, which is not supposed to happen, but it just, they do it anyway. And I think the ordination would still be valid in such a case. But, um, I, I'm not really so much concerned with um, physically disabled people being ordained, but I think the next step, once leftist bhikkhus or leftist Buddhists in the West are able to get bhikkhuni ordination revived somehow, at least to their own satisfaction, then the next step would be trans monks and nuns. And there's no way in hell that that would pass muster based on the polytexts. I mean, you have to have a pair of real balls to be ordained as a monk, for example. And it's pretty similar for, for nuns. I mean, they've got to be genuine, like anatomical females in order, and not just modified to look like they're anatomical females, but they got to be like genuine females physically to be ordained as nuns. And so you're going to have leftist Buddhists so-called self-professed <clears throat> who are going to be agitating to get trans nuns and trans monks ordained and there's no way it would be valid according to Vinaya but they don't care They're, they want to change Vinaya they want to change what the Buddha taught in order to make it more closely fit the leftist agenda and leftist ideals and so forth and a lot of them have the mindset that if in the text the Buddha says anything that's politically incorrect, then he couldn't really have said that because any enlightened being, of course, is going to be a progressive leftist. So, yeah, I think the next step would be ordination of trans monks and nuns, which there's no way, according to the text themselves, there's no way it would be valid. There's no way the ordination would be valid. It wouldn't just be that the monks ordaining such a person would, would get like a, commit a minor offense. I mean, it just would not be an ordination. It would just be an invalid, null and void ordination, which leftists, there are some in the West, especially, who just won't care. They're just going to, it has to be changed. You've got to change the ancient texts. And it's, it's kind of similar with, you know, the Bible. You know, it's like politically correct Christianity. It just ignores, for example, you know, homosexuality, homosexuality being called abomination in the New Testament. I mean, well, so what? You know, it's like, 
times have changed, and so we're just going to change Christianity. And essentially, they're changing it into into the ground. You know, they're just changing it off a cliff, and then now they're trying to do the same thing with Buddhism. And I mean, really, what the the end result is not going to be Dhamma anymore. It's just going to be something called Buddhism, which is really just a kind of Buddhism flavored cultural Marxism or leftist progressivism or whatever you want to call it. So I guess I'll, I'll, I kind of answered that question, sort of, I guess. So I'll just move on to keep the video's next question here, which is, should materialistic people even look deeper into Buddhism? What if they want to become monks because they believe that meditation changes certain processes in their brain and makes them superhuman? Well, I mean, if they're materialists, I don't think that they would believe that you can become superhuman. Would they? I guess I guess maybe you could. They just think it's going to be like enhanced brain function or something. But I think, I mean, it's good for any people to look deeper into Buddhism. Because even if you become a Buddhist for a dumb reason, or whatever the reason is, you become a Buddhist for a dumb reason and you practice it, then your reasons are going to get wiser as you get wiser because practicing Buddhism correctly causes you to have insight and causes your wisdom to progress. You know, you become a wiser person and so your motivations and your reasons are going to become wiser. So even if you become a Buddhist for a dumb reason, you know, you just want good karma so you can get hot chicks or something. Well, if you practice correctly, you know, you're doing meditation and so forth, then those dumb reasons are going to be replaced eventually by less dumb reasons. You're going to have better and better reasons. So it's it's okay for anybody to be interested in Buddhism, even if they're interested for dumb reasons. I mean, if it's a super dumb reason, like a total misunderstanding of what Buddhism is all about, then they'll just fall away from it and no harm done, maybe, unless they just start attacking Buddhism saying that it's bullshit. That does happen sometimes, but that's just inevitable. I mean, that's probably been happening since ancient times. But yeah, I think it's fine for materialistic people or any people to look deeper into Buddhism. And if they're practicing it correctly and not just trying to change it to, you know, suit the tastes of some spiritually bankrupt fashion, then yeah, then, you know, as I've been saying, there, there are reasons are going to get wiser as they get wiser. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question, also from Keep Divinia, and this is the very last question. This is the last one. And that is, do you tend more towards reincarnation or annihilation after death? Well, I lean more towards reincarnation or rebirth. Clearly, I don't. I really don't think that when you're dead, you're just dead. Although, I do not think that it's necessarily the way the books say it is. I don't think that rebirth happens necessarily the way Abhidhamma philosophy and the commentarial traditions say that it is, say that it happens. But something along the lines of rebirth, I, I use it as a working hypothesis. I don't have any proof one way or the other, but I do consider rebirth of some sort to be um, a working hypothesis. I do think that it could just be a matter of similarity that, um, you know, you have a certain personality, you have certain drives and motivations and ideals and so forth. And so if down the line, somebody very similar to you is born with very similar qualities, then in a way it's, it's almost you. It's, it's like a continuation of you in a slightly different form. I mean, it could even happen that way. Um, I mean, that's kind of the way it is just from one moment to the next. It's like, according to Theravada Buddhism, you know, every molecule, you know, the, the matter of our bodies is appearing and disappearing, you know, a trillion times a second. Or a trillion times an eye blink, I should say. And the only thing, I mean, there's nothing really connecting them. I mean, it's like everything just blinks out of existence and then you've got nothing and then it blinks back into existence. And so there's really no connection between one blink and the next blink. It's just similarity, as far as I can tell. So it could be that way with regard to uh, rebirth also, just a matter of similarity. 
resulting in uh, <clears throat> what appears to be a rebirth and may as well be it's effectively the rebirth with um, but I mean it could be that there is like a spiritual component also and uh, actually I kind of lean more towards the spiritual component I was just kind of tossing an idea out there but um, yeah I mean it's you wouldn't have an immortal soul that is reborn or reincarnated again into meat but um, yeah it's, it's like according to Buddhism it's just the momentum of your karma and I do agree with that it's like the very the first close experience I had with death with regard to with another person dying was I was living in a monastery in Burma and the only other monk there was this old monk who got up in the middle of the night to go out and take a pee and stepped on a cobra and was bitten two or three times by said cobra and died and so one day he's we did the, the posita ceremony the, the previous day and you know he's talking you know I was you know we're just hanging out you know he's this this other person he's this friend of mine the very next day it's just an it and then the very next day after that he was just this little bowl of charred bones and ashes and it's just so counterintuitive that you could have the complexity of a human mind you know with all these desires and preferences and dreams and hopes and all this just all of a sudden just cut off and there's nothing it's just so counterintuitive that it really doesn't surprise me at all that you know there's always been a belief in some kind of continuation after death but um i still my father claimed that he, he could remember some of his past lives I've, I've talked about that a little bit in previous videos and um yeah i can't really give my entire case for accepting rebirth of some sort as uh, a working hypothesis but certainly i don't i'm not an annihilationist i'm not necessarily an eternalist either so i'm following the middle path between annihilationism and eternalism and that's that was the last question by gully so if you got any questions especially if they're questions you think that maybe i can answer in a, some kind of useful and constructive way then uh, feel free to ask in the comments below or if you have access to the discord server you can ask them there if you have access to my subscribe star channel you can ask them there and hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already and be happy